Morgan. So I'm Andy Warfield, co-founder and uh, CTO of, uh, of Coho. And I've just explained um, you know, the performance challenges that we had on the data path of doing, uh, of, you know, basically connecting these high performance PCIe flash devices to the 10 gig network. And so now I'm gonna go forward into our architecture and talk about some of the consequences of that in terms of building a scale out system. Um, and so those trios, right, those micro arrays that I described in the last section, right, show up kind of as pillars here. Right, so we've got the PCIe flash, they're spinning disk off behind these, right? You're using the PCI bus instead of SAS or SATA now. You've got, you know, what in other systems would be a controller, right? But it's integrated with the individual piece of storage and you've got an uplink. And so now you're in trouble, right? From a system design perspective because now you have cooked yourself into the corner of building a distributed storage system, right? Previously, you would have put a single head or a pair of redundant heads in front of this thing. And you would have implemented all of your very fine, you know, dedupe file system, volume management, you know, durability logic here. But you can't because these things are trying to stay out of the way of the data path and they're all being connected to the network and now you need some logic that is gonna make that sort of work together. What's more, if you push any of that logic out to the clients, you have to change the clients. And now you have a problem getting into loads and loads of enterprise environments, right? And so, you know, object storage, and I'll talk about this in the, in the next section, right, has, has had lots of good ideas for a long time, but where object storage has required either a single gateway node and suffered from performance or client API changes, it's been largely unsuccessful. And so we're, we're in a system where we're designing across these individually network connected pieces, and we need to figure out how to make it work together. And at this point, we, uh, we made a fun realization, which was that the currently available Ethernet switches in commodity were amazing. That, that there were a bunch of bits of technology that had lived on the Ethernet chipset for a really long time. That OpenFlow, um, for a totally different reason, was starting to expose to a programmatic API. Um, and that we could use these facilities in building a storage system. Okay, so the, the open flow use of SDN switching, right? And so how comfortable are you guys with SDN? Do you, do you need like a quick primer on some of this stuff or? We're storage guys, only Tom okay. understands so, it. So Tom understands the SDN. <coughs> so. By the way, if anyone's interested in SDN, we have lots of great SDN videos <laughs> at techfieldday.com. <laughs> so, so we actually include a switch in the product. Right, so our base offering right, is this 2U, 2 microarray uh, device and a 1U 52 port 10 gig switch. Uh, both are commodity, it's an SDN switch. What, what SDN um, was kind of designed to let you do was to do more careful and fine-grained flow management in data center environments. Right? There are two really simple use cases for this. Um, use case number one is isolating um, per tenant traffic, right? So this is effectively VLANs, except VLANs suck at scale, right? You only have 4,000 of them, and every switch configures them differently, right? And so they're a nightmare. At, at large enterprise environments where VLANs are actually used to carve up the network, they typically have a big piece of paper somewhere. Right? Sometimes an Excel spreadsheet, if they're really good, that has the VLAN allocations. Right? It's, 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 it's basically you know, this, this hard assignment problem across all of their network. The other one is when traffic management. Okay, so if you are a big enterprise and you spend, I think Microsoft spends something like $10 million a year on their transatlantic, trans, transoceanic trunks, right, to connect their sites, right, in terms of paying AT&T and other tier ones to, to give them those links. Um, this stuff is billed using a really weird billing model. It's a little bit different. If, if storage could figure out how to charge like this, it would be great, right? Network companies charge for networking at 90th percentile billing, right? So your 90th percentile burst consumption of a wide area link is what you pay for the billing period, right? It's, it's great because it lets the provider, right, make more money, but also plan for this worst case 
right? And it incents the user to themselves balance their traffic load over time, right? It incents you not to burst. And so in the WAN traffic management case, OpenFlow is being pretty successfully used to steer flows, especially lower priority flows over more idle links, right? And so what it does is you basically get a bunch of fine-grained rules on the switch, right? You've got your switch, you've got a pile of ports off of here. Normally, you run, you know, Ethernet and spanning tree and you get an L2, right? If you use VLANs, you get a bunch of L2s, right? What OpenFlow is doing is there are actually three pretty cool pieces of hardware on this switch, right? There is a L2 forwarding table, there's an L3 forwarding table, and there's a TCAM, right? This one hosts somewhere in the neighborhood of 64,000 to 128,000 uh, Mac to... Could you switch to a blue marker? Oh, yeah, sure. Sorry about that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want me to redraw this? Or? What's wrong with green? <laughs> <laughs> so the cameras don't pick it up. Mac to point and Howard, for them Howard that didn't need an answer. L3 is... And uh, you don't work for them anymore. <laughs> Who does number two work for? Okay, so these two tables are just, um, you know, in-memory trees, basically. They take a, a MAC address or an IP address or an IP address wildcard and map it to a port, right? This is what you get when you run your routing protocols or your spanning tree protocol, right? This thing um, is a fully associative uh, lookup table, and it lets you push down arbitrary matching rules, right, onto these, uh, onto these frames that come through. And so what you can do is you can say, for instance, for the first 60 bytes, varies based on chipset of a packet, right? I can put in a rule that says if the TCP, sorry, if the IP protocol field is TCP, right? And the TCP protocol field is something else, send it to this port, right? If I match on the IP source address and this destination port, send it here. If I don't match, send me an exception, right? And so the thing that has been really interesting in terms of the way that OpenFlow has sort of developed is that they have taken advantage of these chipset features that are enabling very fast forwarding. Um, and they've cleanly decoupled control and data on these systems. And, and first, so, the L2 is MAC to, to NAT, is that? MAC to port, sorry. That's two. Both of these are, sorry, IP slash MAC. Both of these are going to a port. Port. Right, so basically I get to say, if you have this MAC address, right, ship it to this port, right? So they're just fast forwarding lookups. Yeah. This one lets you do much more arbitrary stuff. Um, and so rather than working within these traditional protocols on the switch, right, rather than using things like ARP to program these tables, right, and working on a fixed L2, what OpenFlow lets you do is to very precisely say, this flow needs to go to this port. Or if you see an NFS flow that you haven't seen before, right, <clears throat> let me know, and I'll tell you what to do. Right? So it lets you shim in all sorts of really clever stuff on the network. All three of these tables end up being pretty interesting from a storage perspective for different reasons. Um, the one that I'm going to talk about first is, is the TCAM, and primarily is going to be the TCAM. We can, we can come back to these two a little bit more later. Um, one of the real sort of interesting things that you get out of this is it lets you orchestrate an elaborate lie. Um, and so our system, as a 2U, right, microarray, right, box with the switch above it, you run four wires like this, right? If you add another 2U below it, right, we'll plumb another four wires down here. What you see in connecting your clients, and by the way, you can connect clients with the full width of the switch, right? So you get full cross-sectional bandwidth between clients and these nodes, is a single NFS IP address. So people have been struggling with this, and it's always involved client change, right? This is why we have things like PNFS and NFS v4 delegation. Right, that, that you want to be able to fork your data path off to the data, right? but you have to change the client. What we can do with OpenFlow on the switch is this pretty straightforward trick of distributing the TCP stack on the server side across as many boxes as we have behind it. And so you see a single NFS IP address. 
when a client connects, right, when an ESX host comes in here, the connection comes in and we go, who should we give this flow to? Who is the least loaded? We can move it into this microarray. If we happen to place two nodes onto that thing and they start to saturate the link, we can actually move the session for one of them over to another port. Right? We can throw that connection over to somebody else. Right? If we want to move you closer to your data, we can do that too. Right? So we can basically take what has traditionally been the NFS head's single connection to the network and scale it in the same way that we scale the underlying storage. Okay, so this is one way that SDN is really, really interesting in terms of building a, a scale out storage system. And we're just using OpenFlow at this level. Right? The reason that we include the switch from this perspective is you know, we didn't want to bet on wide scale OpenFlow deployment. Right? We hope that these networks get to a point that, that we can throw away our use of the switch. Right? We're, we're using the protocol as it stands today. So each node gets four direct paths to the switch? Yes. Each to you. Each to you node. Yeah. And then... Uh, two use two nodes. So, so, exactly. Oh, okay. So two microarrays. And then uh, the host has how many ports to the, to the, to the complex, to the, to the array? It's as many NICs as you have on your ESX host. And it's a 50-port switch, is that what you said? 52-port switch, yeah. So I've got just a couple questions. Yeah, sure. You <laughs> Mike, okay. yeah, I have. Um, <laughs> you're buying the switch from a vendor yes. and including it with your system. Yep. Did you put some thought into possibly getting Broadcom Trident 2 for yourself in building this? Yep. Um, Was it just a... Yeah, so we've, we've, this is, I love this question, um, because there's lots of interesting stuff behind this. So um, there, are, uh, there are a bunch of, we've, we've talked to all of the chipset vendors. Uh, we've talked to a bunch of the switch reference design builders. Um, there was a brief fleeting period of time where we thought what we should do is build our own hardware for the whole thing, right? And then we found out how slowly that would move and how much it would cost. Um, we have, I think, a pretty good understanding of, of what's going on at that level. Interestingly, on the SDN side, this is a technology that's been spectacularly hyped, right? Like, you know, everybody's really excited about it. And with cost, right, those two use cases that I mentioned are not insignificant. They're really, really useful uh, application cases. But I think that all of the chipset vendors and many of the switch vendors think that they're, we are on the dawn of this app store on switches, right? That there's at least... 2,000 really cool network things that nobody has been able to think of yet, right, that are going to be able to be pushed down onto these devices and, and are going to get lots of traction. And when we started talking to the, uh, to the switch chipset vendors and stuff, I think that the, we got a very warm reception, right? They were really excited to hear some of the things that we wanted to use the switch for in terms of building storage. And we started to realize that there weren't a lot of people coming to them with really, really concrete application cases. Um, and so I, I, I think that you know, the SDN is super interesting that way, but we want to stick with commodity. Um, so we're trying to push these guys to, there, there are a bunch of ways that these switches can get better and actually be more supportive of storage. Is there an open flow controller that sits inside this whole conglomeration of hardware that I can access and program? <laughs> Excuse me. Or is your controller basically an off? so that it's if this link gets congested switch these flows over to the next least congested link for for I'll come around in a sec how am I doing for time um, and if you're gonna get to this in you know, the next no part no of the I, well so let me let me come back to it because I'm gonna show you how the what I've really talked about so far is the bottom half okay. of our stack and that's probably easier to talk about when I come around to go the right ahead then. okay okay um, Okay, so I, I wanted to go through the NFS traffic steering example as like a, you know, a clear benefit in terms of, of how this works, right? how it lets us you know, back into supporting legacy protocols. Um, any other questions on this stuff? Keep going. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to show you uh, a, a bit of a demo of, of what this means. And this is the part where I'm hoping not to break the sync on the display. So let me just see <laughs> if I can do this. Okay, so I'm going to try and draw an analog to, to, to what's happening with software-defined networking when I talk about the storage placement, right? In SDN, um, you get this cool thing. You get this central controller that's able to make decisions about where to steer stuff, right? This has been um, both uh, 
both uh, celebrated and, and maligned about SDN, right? That this thing lets you make central decisions that have historically been done in a very, very distributed computer science -y way, right? You, you build BGP or IGMP <laughs> or spanning tree as a peer-wise protocol where a bunch of switches can try and make good decisions about how to forward data, right? And you cross your fingers that that system doesn't explode, right? One of the neat yeah, benefits of... <laughs> Definitely finger crossing. <laughs> one of the, and when it does, you, you know, spend a lot of time trying to unplug the wire that is, that is causing you trouble. Um, one of the, the neat properties that's fallen out of the central controller notion in OpenFlow is, is that algorithm design gets a lot easier. Right? You, you suck up the fact that you've got a central bit of the system, you make it redundant, right? you deal with those concerns, but you get a single place that you can implement a bunch of pretty cool logic with a full view of the load of the system, for example. Um, and that's, that's, to a certain degree, uh, what we're doing in terms of, of placing data in the storage system, right? So this is a, uh, a visualization. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you can think of, of a row in this diagram as being um, a 2U box, right? So this is four 10 gig ports, right? With four flashcards, there's a bunch of disk off the back, right? And there's another 2U and there's another 2U. Um, I have, for simplicity, five VMDKs on here. So these are large VMware image files. Um, and across these, I've placed a bunch of data. And so rather than doing what you would normally do in building a storage system, which is to start with a whole bunch of disparate devices and add layers up to get you to a homogenous thing, right? To get you to a volume that's actually, you know, a RAID 10 or a RAID DP, like aggregate. Um, or using some kind of consistent hashing that lets you just, you know, erase your code and throw your data into something and hope that it lands in a fairly balanced way, right? We've taken a much more networking approach to placement, right? We think down from the top. And so for A.VMDK, right, I have policy, policy kind of like you would see probably in, in, in an object storage system, except object storage policy is usually around things like retention. It's not around like generally really, really performance sensitive properties because there aren't a lot of really high performance object storage systems. But what this is saying is there's effectively a forwarding um, graph, right, for this VMDK. It says stripe the thing eight ways and replicate each stripe twice. Okay? And so as I hover over these things, right, what you see is that the replicas have centrally been placed for all objects across nodes in the system. Right? Since there is a shared power supply, on these two things, because we have two 10 gig NICs, two uh, sockets, uh, and two flash devices, but on a single motherboard, it, you don't want to place your replicas across those things, right? They're, they're a shared failure domain. And so we divide the system into two failure domains, and so you see half of the replicas on one side and half on the other side, right? Now, the placement in here. So the, the A and B servers in the chassis go into separate. Yeah, they go into separate groups. Um, okay. Yes, and with redundant switches, uh, if you want to get into that, we, we, we wire as a, as a butterfly, effectively. Right? So you wire the A into both switches, right. Right? and then out to redundant ports on your clients, and we run active-active. Right? And so the result of that is if you lose a switch, you lose half of your bandwidth, but none of your connectivity. Right. Right? Um, so we've got a bunch of placement logic that basically says, I've got all these objects, they're divided up all these ways, there are a whole bunch of rules about how they can be placed next to each other, right? We, we need to try and spread load out across all these boxes. Um, as we go forward, this load response will even include placement um, in response to client demand, right? To move stuff around, that's not in the, in the GA. But what you see here is as I go back here and I add an extra um, four boxes to the system, Right? The system responds to the available storage and it migrates these around, right? similar to what you would do with VMs in a, in a VMware environment or a Zen environment. Right? You live migrate the storage to replace it in response to the, the available resources in the system. Um, if you fail a so node... The, so this is actually the management GUI? No, no, this is, uh, this is a GUI that one of the guys put together so I could explain this concept. <laughs> so this is not in the... Because oh, uh, I was impressed there for a second. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'll show you the management GUI in a sec. Um, we're looking at actually packaging this as a, as a VM that you can install to interrogate the system. Um, okay. But it's, it's really... Uh, it's, so it's, it's just a pane of glass onto the logic in the, in the switch. 
And so um, you, you added? I added four. Four microarrays. Yep. Um, and because you had a trivially small amount of data, it rebalanced, essentially. That's right. That's right. Um, the rebalance is a lower priority than servicing exactly. requests. Yep. And it gets, uh, it gets a 10% slice of a bandwidth right, okay. that you can carve out. So, so it happens in the background. That's right. Um, and on top of that, the NFS connections also balance, right? So you spread out your, your offered load on top of it. So the data is replicated? Yes, yes. The default policy, so we don't actually expose this bit of the system in our GA, right? So this policy, right, we default do uh, eight stripes, two replicates, right? We have uh, taken pains to, to avoid dials, right, and knobs in the, in the UI. I'll show you the UI in a few minutes. Um, and so we didn't want to get into something that had a whole bunch of, like, you know, what replication factor should I choose for this stuff? But the underlying system is completely configurable for that. And so we'll, we'll decide how much to expose as we, as yeah, we go Yeah, I mean, forward. you, you kind of have to expose three, or, three replicas. Yeah. yeah. And we know. Um, so, um, okay, the other thing here is when I fail one of these, right, the other objects on this are spread across the other side of the system. And so failure response. For redundancy. Yeah. But, but also, right, there, it's, it's not like pairwise replica, right? And it's not volume level replica, it's object replication. And so the recovery to failure scales as you add nodes, which means that if I fail this, all of those nodes get to participate. <laughs> there you go. It's, it's, it's going on my display and not this one. Get to participate in the recovery, right? So recovery actually gets faster as you scale the system out. Right, which is a neat property, right? Because you're just spreading the data over more nodes. Thought I had demo this for a second there. But it seems okay. Um, and, and, and those are ports, effectively. They're not controllers. They're not drives. They're those ports. are ports. Yeah. You're talking about. Yeah. Um, okay. So da, 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 da. I, I don't know if there's is there more that I want to talk about here. I think there is don't ask us, we don't know. <laughs> um, no, I think there's not. Um, so, I, I, I'm, and I'm going to come back to this uh, in, the, in the next section, but the, the thing that I, I just want to end that on is we've taken kind of a hypervisor-style approach to this, to this memory, right? We're, we're balancing it and exposing it to the network, but we're also trying to do the least possible stuff at this bottom layer, right? So this bottom layer is really responsible for isolation and multi-tenancy, right? The same way a hypervisor is for a CPU, right? Those little pieces of objects that are there, right, are, are sparse flash devices, right, backed by auto-tiered disks, right? The, the software that we are connecting it to the network with is just doing that isolation, right? It's, it's getting out of the way, right? This idea of striping and replication is something that we've built on top of it, and it's just a dispatch library, right? It's just a chunk of code that, you know, you open the object, you look up its table, and you can use this to forward requests to the appropriate Use the flash for, for writes as well as reads? Yeah. Yep. A couple more questions. Yes. You said that the idea in the future is that you're going to get away from using a, an OEM switch from some other vendor and basically just kind of plug this directly into the network so that everything works. Can I use a non-coho switch today? Um, so today, the, uh, the GA product, um, we're using an Arista in it. Uh, uh, despite um, coming out of the gates being fairly negative on OpenFlow, Arista has ended up being pretty easy to work with from an OpenFlow perspective. Um, and they also have a pretty nice environment to work with in terms of scripting. Um, so our GA um, has a bunch of you know, integration assumptions cooked into the Arista. But, so the answer is, is like no, but almost. Right? It's, so, no, no, but you can try if you want. Just don't call us when it breaks. Yeah, yeah. Now, which OpenFlow spec did you guys write to? 1.0 or 1.3? 1.2. 1.2. Yeah. Okay. So as long as my switch supports 1.2 or better, I'm golden for whatever you guys are doing with it? We would need to do, like, we've, I've never tested against a non-Arista switch, right? right? And we actually run a VM on the switch, right? The VM can be moved off the switch. So there's, like, a little bit of well, I'm like just thinking of some with... applications where we have customers who have already deployed some open sure, from sure. non-Arista sources, but it supports 1.3. Yep. And, I mean, my, my favorite answer, well, there's no reason why it shouldn't work, <laughs> but, but, you know, at the same time, I don't want to, to blow something up. And, I mean, there's... If you're buying a sufficient number of yeah. micro arrays, they will talk to you. <laughs> we, we will send you an engineer. No, let's, let's talk about it after. I'd love to, yeah, I'd love to hear about those, those customers.